how much do you value the Earth, our planet? When I was a kid, I was fascinated by the stars and galaxies. I was not so much into telescopes, but I really liked the great mystery of the night sky. When you study astronomy, you become really aware of how precious and unique our planet is. There is this story I really like. Maybe some of you have heard it before. In 1977, NASA, the aerospace agency, launched this spacecraft, Voyager 1, to cross and collect data of our solar system. More than 10 years later, when Voyager 1 was leaving the solar system, it got instructions to turn its camera around to take a final picture of the Earth. At that distance, a record distance of 6 billion kilometers, the Earth is just a pale blue dot. Carl Sagan coined this expression. He wrote something like this. Look at that dot, that is here, that is us, that is home. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, lived out their lives. But it's not only the whole of human history, it's also all the plants and animals that ever existed, all the life we know, all of that had as home this tiny blue sphere, so rich and so fragile. That is our Earth, the Earth that you value. But it's 2023, and we are facing climate and ecological crisis unprecedented in human history. What can we do about it? During my studies in astronomy, that question became more important to me than the mysteries of the night sky. So when I finished those studies, I looked for programs on sustainability. But in those studies, I felt that we were focusing too much on little changes and technological solutions. And of course we need renewable energy, but if we keep using fossil fuels and we use all that energy to increase production and consumption, where does that leave us? I felt that there was a lack of attention to the underlying roots of unsustainability. So, years later, when I got an opportunity to do a PhD, I decided to focus on consumption. I wanted to understand what influences consumption. Why do we consume? But I wanted to look at it from the perspectives of many different disciplines. And while doing that research, I realized that there are three big myths in common discussions around, this, around consumption. Myth one, we consume because we are selfish, greedy individuals. Myth two, consumption is caused by consumer behavior. Myth three, we can act only as consumers. But of course, these myths are not really true. Let's start with the first myth. We consume because we are selfish, greedy individuals. This is a common narrative. We hear it in discussions, we read it in newspapers. The story goes that we consume mainly to show off status and motivated by selfish reasons. But actually, when I was reviewing many different disciplines, I saw that there are many different reasons why, why we consume. At the basic level, we consume to meet basic requirements of food, clothing, shelter. And then some disciplines highlight that social reasons are very important as well. 
we consume to care for those in our families as an act of devotion. We consume to maintain relationships to others, for example, through this uh, social norm of giving gifts for birthdays or special holidays. We consume some things rather than others to express our identity to those around us, for example, through the clothes we choose to wear. But very often we consume just because it's normal, because everyone is doing it around us and we don't want to be weird. Another strong explanation for consumption is that says that we do it to be able to engage in practices. For example, we want to cook, we need some kitchen utensils, some ingredients, and access to a kitchen. We want to play sports, we need some, often some shoes and some equipment. We want to go camping, we need a tent, a sleeping bag, a mattress, so we need things to do activities, but is it that simple? My parents have an old tent from the times that we were camping when I was a kid. That tent is still in a good condition, so why did I buy a new one? This brings us to other explanations for consumption. We consume as well because we are attracted to novelty, and because of changing aspirations and conventions around comfort and convenience. In fact, the tent I bought is much lighter, it is easier to pitch, and it's way more waterproof than the old one. So consumption is also driven by technological changes and improvements. But is this all? In fact, all the explanations I shared so far refer only to why we consume at all. They don't address why consumption plays such a central role in our societies, nor why has consumption increased so tremendously in the past century. For that, we need to go to the second myth. The second myth says that Consumption is caused by consumer behavior. I mean, I can see why we would think of it in that way. Consumption comes from consumers, right? Well, not entirely. When I delved into disciplines that focus more on structural aspects, such as political economy, sociology, and history, it became clear that consumption is caused by many different actors and contexts. A famous sociologist, Jean Baudrillard, he wrote, and I quote, the system of needs is the product of the system of production. End of quote. In other words, the system of production creates needs, not the other way around. In many of our countries, our economies, are based on, dependent on, more and more production and more and more consumption. Economic growth requires increasing levels of production and consumption. To enable this, marketing, advertising, mass consumption spaces occupy central roles in our cities and our daily lives not to speak of strategies such as plan of obsolescence through which businesses design products in ways that make it difficult or impossible to repair. Governments often appeal to citizens to consume more as means to stimulate the economy. There has been different periods in history in different places where consumption has played a bigger role but nothing compares to the increase in mass consumer goods since the second half of the 20th century. The US American historian, Elizabeth Cohen, she tells that in the, U in the US, after the Second World War, people were not that eager to consume. 
but many actors, such as businesses, the government, trade unions, advertisers, the media, they promoted and communicated the idea that consumption was not, and I quote, a personal indulgence, but a civic responsibility designed to raise the living standards of all Americans. End of quote. With time, this paradigm spread around the world. With time, the notion of citizen became overshadowed by the concept of consumer. With time, being able to choose among a wide selection of mass-made products became synonymous with the idea of freedom. And with time, all that energy and resources needed for all that production and consumption, mostly based on fossil fuels, drove us to this point in history. It is 2023, and we are facing climate and ecological crisis unprecedented in human history. What can we do about it? Finally, we have to shed the third myth. The third myth says that we can act only as consumers. We consume, sure, we buy things, but we also repair them. We care for people and for the world. Sometimes we organize. Some of the most important progress made in history was due to the long efforts of movements and collectives. Women's rights, environmental protections, the 40-hour work week. By the way, it's about time we work on reducing those hours as well. But what I want to say is that people have much more power and agency than their own individual decisions of what to buy. We are family members, we are friends, we are neighbors, workers, citizens. We have all these dimensions within us and many more. I say we keep that in mind and when we can, we push for changes. We organize to change structures within all those dimensions. In our neighborhoods, our cities, our workplaces, our countries. When I talk about this topic, people always ask me, but what can I do? I finally have an answer to that question. There is no easy five-step plan to dismantle consumer society. There is not. We have to be ready to say goodbye to the belief system that says that we need economic growth. And those in power, they are rarely courageous enough to change paradigms. More often, they only decide on major shifts once a new paradigm has already spread throughout society. So let us spread this new paradigm of an economy that cares for people and the environment above all else of a society that prioritizes the well-being of people and the health of ecosystems, as these are the basis of human life on Earth, our only planet. Changing a paradigm, an economic system, a culture, is hard, but I want to leave you with some hope. This reality of economies based on consumption and economic growth is actually very recent in human history. Our grandparents grew up in a very different world where things were repaired and used for a long time. I don't want to go back in time, but I want to remind us all that if so much has changed so tremendously 
in such a short period of time, this means that it can change again. Thank you.